welcome to The Truth in His Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. Today, I am interviewing the director of the Center of Visual Arts at Johns Hopkins University and the Homewood's, Homewood Arts Program. I told you I was going to mess up. Uh, additionally, my guest is an artist whose work examines the construction of gender and its social, sexual, and political implications on women's lives. Please welcome Margaret Murphy. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks so much, Rob. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're, we're going to class up the place. We're going to have great artists. I, I, see, <laughs> so, see, sometimes, and, and, and don't take this outside of the nature in which it's intended. When I think of an artist, I think of your visual, like the hair, the glasses, the whole setup. That's what I right. think of when I think of an artist sometimes. <laughs> Really? It's like, yeah, so we're going to a gallery right now, aren't we? This is this is what's happening. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So I didn't have a preconceived idea of a podcaster, so <laughs> usually a usually a white guy with a neck beard. Um oh, right. kind of okay. chubby, Cheeto fingers, I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> Um, but I want to I want to get into the the vital sets. I like to sure. when I bring on the guests, I like to have them describe it. Like I can touch on what one's background is, but I like to let you know the guests give their vital stats. So, what's your background and what currently inspires you? Inspires the work that you're doing or the work that you're around these days? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd say my background's probably not that typical for um, a lot of artists in that. Um, well, I grew up in Baltimore. I'm originally from Baltimore. Yeah. And, um, so I actually grew up in the Medfield Hamden area okay. and the, this is 1960s, seventies, right? It's not the Hamden of today. Um, and, but, you know, that's really informed a lot of my, um, you know, definitely work and my perspective, um, in that, um, you know, it was a very, on the one hand, it was a great place to grow up because, you know, it was kind of time period where you could just open the door, go out, I'd be out all day and then come home. Um, there wasn't all this like sort of over scheduling that, that kids have now, but, you know, there was also, um, you know, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement. Um, there was a lot going on in Baltimore at the time. Um, I, you know, really feel that I lived kind of gender inequality and was really, you know, up close and personal to a lot of the racial things that were going on at the time too. Sure. Um, so, and then on top of that, I think just the, you know, Baltimore has this, you know, maybe people don't like this, but like, at least when I was, you know, uh, coming up like this kind of kitsch element to it, like, I remember going into um, John Waters, um, Edith the Egg Lady. She used to have a thrift store, like going in there and, you know, just this idea of this quirkiness that was in the city. And certainly in my own family, like they were not art collectors, but they would collect, you know, kitsch. Yeah. Um, and so that's very much informed, you know, sort of the way I see class um, and how that intersects really with um, race and gender. So, um, oh, so the second part of your question, like what inspires me? I think, you know, it's continued. It's been very consistent throughout the years. And what inspires me is this, you know, intersection of class and gender yeah. and race. Um, because I grew up in Hamden, <laughs> you know, like, um, so, you know, it's, it's always been something that I've really questioned and wanted to, you know, what, you know, why does this exist? Um, and so I do deal with that in my work. Um, and, you know, also this idea of material culture, like what makes something, you know, valuable or not valuable. So, you know, I work a lot with that in my paintings for sure. Um, so, you know, what inspires me now is, what has always inspired me, like just what's in my everyday environment, um, you know, what's on the news, what is at the store, you know, when I lived in Jersey City, I lived in Jersey City for close to 30 years and I loved it there. It's right outside Manhattan, um, you know, on the Hudson River. Um, but again, a very a, like sort of working class city, or at least, you know, it used to be. Sure. And there were just dollar stores everywhere. So, and it wasn't, it, it's not kitsch. I mean, people are buying things in dollar stores like knickknacks and things as decor. Yeah. 
um, you know, I've, I've, I've not done to that be in, ironic. I've done know? that in my home or what have you. And moving into my first house, like moving from a studio apartment to like a two bedroom, three bath house. I was like, I don't have anything. I need stuff to fill areas and right. hitting the dollar store. I was like, I am broke. I don't need many of these things, but it seems weird to have bare walls. And right. <laughs> Yeah. So I started collecting and really looking at, you know, what was in there and who was buying them and, you know, what message they were sending, you know, these things that you can buy that are mass produced Mm -hmm. um, and mass collected. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and what kind of message is inherent in them? And I found a lot of them to be sexist and racist, Um, you know, so, and I think that's important to see, you know, what is being represented, right? Yeah. And and what is readily available? Um, and so I'd make paintings about that. So uh, obviously, you know, I, see, I, I, I'm going to frame it like some of my research almost feels stalkerish because I, I'm like trying to do a deep dive to like, let me look at the work. Let me look at this person's previous interview. Yeah, and, so on. Sure. and I've had some guests was like, look, how did you find that out? I was like, <laughs> that in an interview. I don't know what to tell you. But, right, um, right. So, so tell me about the um, women in black paintings. Um, are there specific subjects or themes that you return to regularly? And I think you've kind of touched on that. Um, but why are you, why do you find yourself returning to those themes if that's what you've already like touched on per se? Right, because it hasn't changed. It hasn't gone away. You know, like. Um, the Women in Black series, actually, I did. I was doing an artist residency in Michigan, in central Michigan. Um, it was an amazing opportunity, um, you know, with a studio and a, and a cabin and on a river. But it happened to be during the 2016 presidential election. Interesting and time. <laughs> very, yeah. I was very isolated, for one thing, except for my colleagues there, you know, at the university. They were great. Um But, you know, it wasn't a super friendly Hillary town. Um, And, you know, I was really excited to have, a you know, the first woman ever as the Democratic nominee for president. And I was all in. Well, she didn't win. Right. And um, so it was just it was kind of heartbreaking. And I just felt really let down by, you know, society and culture in this country. And because a lot of what I was seeing too was, you know, wasn't your typical, like I'm against that candidate. It was Trump, that bitch. And, you know, like really personal kind of misogynistic things. Totally. And then of course, Trump coming out with his, you know, grab them video, Mm -hmm. um, which, Oh no, boys will be boys. Um, But I was, yeah, exactly. And it was just like hurt, you know, I took it personal. Yeah. <laughs> but at the time, also, I was just listening to the radio one day. I was in my studio and I um, heard about this protest in Poland where reproductive rights were being taken away and women went into the streets all wearing black to protest. So they left work or school or home or whatever it was and just went out in the streets. And I just thought, you know, I'm hearing this, but I'm visualizing it like all these women in black. Yeah. Um, so I just started collecting black clothing from women as a kind of collective mourning for like, here we are, we're, you know, this is 2016. And we're still having this same debate yeah. um, about reproductive rights and about, you know, misogyny and why a woman can't be president or have to have, you know, control over her own body. So that also led to, I did a couple of performance pieces with that where um, one was in um, uh, Brooklyn, another one was in Jersey City, where I would set up with my ink and my paper and I would announce it and women would come with an article of clothing that they own, like that was black. And it could be anything, pair of pants. I wasn't asking for morning clothes necessarily, just everyday clothes of every day day women and they would bring them and I'd paint them on the spot. So they would take like 10 or 15 minutes and then that would be part of the exhibition and they would take their clothes back. So it became a collaboration with other women who were feeling the same way as that I was because we were all stunned and in disbelief, you know? Um, So yeah, it was really, it was a great way to like do live painting and to share this kind of grief with other women. Yeah, I I think that 
particular energy brought out of a lot of change and like action, like where people are like, I am like overtly fed up with this shit. Yeah. And um, then really that's what this podcast is a response to. Cause like in looking at it, like I was doing another more of a comedy podcast during the campaign trail. I was like, this is not going to happen. We're, we're right. we won't let this happen. I'm just sitting there. I was like, come on America. You can do better than that. Yeah. And then when it happened, I was like, you know how certain things might hit you like like I think you were kind of describing it actually. Certain things will hit you very like oh, that's that's just right there. You did you cut right yeah. through the, to the bone, and all of this stuff that was said from 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 that like president or candidate then president yeah. didn't impact me until it hit something that was overarching. It wasn't yeah. like. I'm expecting these like terrible things to come out of your mouth and your behavior to be what it is. But right. when you start taking a, a shot at a city that has every walk of life in it and right. it's just misinformed, I was like, what can I actually do? What is, what is my standpoint? What is the thing that I can do? And I was like, let me try to disprove it. And that's really what, what this is, what this, this aims to be. So how, how would you describe your artistic style and, what artistic movements or artists have influenced you? Oh, um, I guess, I mean, my style is very representational. Um, you know, I work from observation. I, you know, uh, you know, really paint what I see. Um, but, you know, it's also the work is very idea driven. So, you know, I don't do a lot of complex compositions and, you know, it's more about like presenting the object, which is a stand in for either the figure or some idea related to it. Um, I'm definitely, well, I'm influenced by all art really, you know, going back to, I don't know, Byzantine to Egyptian to, but, you know, really pop art has been a, a really big influence on me. Um, and, you know, I would say conceptual art and minimalism and, and color field painting for sure. Um, and, you know, figurative painting. Um, so kind of, everything <laughs> i dig it i dig it <laughs> i've narrowed that down <laughs> yeah i was just like oh wow that's so so specific <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah i'm uh dig dig pop art i have a few books here it's like I, i'm like i was a uh i did the mural stuff when i was younger uh comic book writing and comic book art like the whole gamut and uh now, this is just like my medium uh, that I just kind of right. travel in, uh, I guess, storytelling, although I just say I'm just being a jerk with a microphone. But what do I know? <laughs> um, so your, your work has been represented in solo and group exhibitions internationally in museums, art centers and galleries. Is there an experience that really kind of pops out as rewarding or challenging to you? And was there something like you learned from it? Like, you know, like some people say, oh, I only had wins. And it's like, but did you right. learn anything? Or some yeah. people like everything yeah. sucked and I didn't learn. Yeah. Anything. <laughs> I think it's a combination. Sure. <laughs> uh, no. Um, yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all just part of it. You know, it's just, um, I would say, Oh, geez, this is kind of a hard one. Cause I'd have to remember, I have to remember things, you know, <laughs> But, um, you know, going back again to that experience back in um, Michigan, sure. you know, it's always great when you work with a curator or two who pushes you in some way. And that was my um, experience there. And that, you know, I drove out there with all my work. But then when I got there, she um, really encouraged me to, you know, show the work you know, if I felt that it would, it would help it in an installation format and I ended up working with students and we hand stenciled like an 18 foot wall with wallpaper. And it really contextualized the paintings. Like they were these dress paintings of like, you know, Abercrombie dresses, you know, for a 17 year old. Um, and then I put it in the context of a wallpaper that, said one in five and it's all very beautiful and there's you know color on top of color and decor and beauty but one in five was the sexual assault stats on college campuses at the time now it's probably like one in four or something but um so again to take the sort of you know 
the dress, which is very beautiful. And it's almost has a look of innocence and then put it in, you know, but it's being marketed to, you know, young adult women um, and put it in this context. It makes you see it differently or, you know, hopefully helps you see it differently. I guess I should say that. Um, But really any, you know, I've had so many great experiences with, you know, colleagues where we've um, worked together on an exhibition or, Um, You know, I did a traveling tenure exhibition that went through New Jersey and also to Goucher College. And that was great because I was it was the first time I'd shown in Baltimore in many years. And I think that was like 2011 or 2012. So that was a lot of fun. Um, You know, logistically had some challenges, you know, to figure out how to get all the work here and catalogs and all of that. But, um, you know, it's all just part of part of the work. Yeah. That's, that's, that's legit. Um, I've sometimes I, I got finally for me, not having the resources, not having the environment sometimes like I right. have all of these grandiose ideas and it's like, this is going to go well. And then, right. <laughs> and, and then, like I said to you before we got started, it's like nerves are kicking. Cause you had that performance anxiety. At least I, at least I have it. And, right. um, and then I have to put on my MacGyver mind. And it's like, all right, something's not yeah. working here with the wiring. Something's not working here with the cable because I'm also my producer. So it's yes. like, all right, let me figure this out. And then I don't have time to even be upset about or be, have nerves. It's just like, I just got to right. go. You just got to do it. Whatever you get is what you get. It's like whatever right. I wrote today is what you're getting. Exactly. It's I like that MacGyver mind, you know, I mean, that's just that's life. Right. And if you accept that, then, you know, things go much better. <laughs> and I think I think we all over the last for in, in, in various ways, but I think we all have had to in a unified way do that, especially right. like in higher ed and and, um, yeah. you know, with with the covid and all of that stuff. It's just like we have these different closings. We have these different changes and pivots that we have to do. And yes you try to make do with it. And I try to operate under the, the, the notion, like, look, you're probably getting 30% efficiency. You, you might be yeah. getting 45. Um, just the nature of things like you can't control if the internet is going to have a, a cap on it. Shout out to Comcast right. or, yeah. you know, these, these different things. And you have to try to make do while being mindful of your safety and the things that, that you need. Right. Well, you know, pivot was, was, or is, you know, the name of the last two years. Right. But that was one thing I was so impressed really with how the creative community sort of adapted to COVID and not just in education, um, but also in education, like, you know, where websites sprung up that had models for like drawing classes, or, you know, I know so many artists who went into mask production and, you know, it's just, you just keep creating whatever that is, you know, to adapt. It's a challenge. It's not necessarily, you know, I mean, this was a bad thing, but you know, the way you, you problem solve it. I mean, it's not what we do. We Mm -hmm. were creative problem solvers. So, you know, it's another challenge to solve. Yeah. And, and that's really like in, in this podcast and where it started, I, I was doing it in a comedy club and meeting people every oh, Friday wow. doing it. And then, you know, that March, the following March, when I started, it was like, oh, yeah, we're shutting down. I was like, ah, how do you use Zoom? How am I going to do this podcast? Yeah, right. And, you know, having what to, is Zoom? Right. I mean, and, I didn't know what it was even. I didn't have to learn these things and didn't learn how to get the audio and modify and all of the different things that I have to do. And it's like, oh, now this is kind of the preferred way of doing it. And, right. you know, doing so many and during this time that it's almost like hours behind the wheel when you're learning to drive. Right. Yeah. So tell me about returning to Baltimore after many years as an artist, educator, curator in that New York metropolitan area. How how has Baltimore changed artistically compared to like, you know, your, your time beforehand? I know that's like a kind of a chunk of time. and A lot of stuff can happen right. in that time. But I guess... In a, in a kind yeah. of like overarching sort of way. I think Baltimore has always been a, you know, culturally rich and, you know, art kind of centric city, you know, because of Micah being here and, you know, all the, you know, tons of other universities, but, you know, we have this world renowned art school here. So it brings in a lot of artists who go to school here and then end up staying here. It's a city that, well, used to be affordable. I mean, maybe it's it's more affordable than New York and northern New Jersey, for sure. But 
Um, yeah, I think it's more affordable for artists to live here. You know, visual artists at least need space. And, you know, that's, that's a hard commodity in the New York Metro area. Um, so, I mean, I was looking for, you know, a full-time, um, teaching position. And, you know, when this you know, particular, um, job, you know, I was offered this job. I thought this is perfect. Like of all the places I could have ended up, I ended up in Baltimore, you know, like I have family here. I have friends here that I've been friends with for since high school for 40 some years, you know, it, it's been great. And, um, I have to say like my absolute favorite part is my studio. Yeah. I have this amazing studio at area 405. Um, you know, it's affordable again, and it's the biggest studio I've ever had. And it's five minutes from my house. And, you know, there's a whole network of artists there. Yeah. So, I mean, surely after I moved in COVID hit, so I haven't really met that many people, but <laughs> in theory, it could be a great way to meet other artists. Totally. Um, but no, it's, you know, it's, it, it's good. I mean, I love Jersey city. That's where I lived. Um, you know, it's like the nation's number one, most diverse city in the country. It's, you know, it's, it's just so, um, you know, densely populated and, you know, it's exciting. I enjoyed living there, but, um, you know, I love being in Baltimore. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really good transition actually. So, in, in teaching um, at, in, you know, at Hopkins and um, being a visiting professor at Micah, how's that experience and been teaching there? Like also like while being an artist, like turn it right. on the side of like, I'm also an educator as well. Right. Well, you know, I've always been an educator. That's how I make my living. Um, and for me, you know, different artists find different ways to make that work. For me, this has always been the best um, best way for me to make a living. I'm, I consider myself like a bit of an extrovert and, and like, I like being around people. So I don't know that I'd want to just be isolated in my studio 24 seven. I like the interaction with students. I like staying connected to, you know, young people. Um, I like turning them on to new artists and I like learning about new artists myself that I can share, you know, that, and, and I love, I, I really like education. Like if we just finished a semester and, you know, you see, you see people like you, you're teaching them how to use materials, you know, and how to problem solve. Like it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and I don't, there's no real difference between teaching in Baltimore or teaching in New York or, um, you know, cause students come from all over. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the Hopkins students, I mean, I would say teaching Hopkins students is sort of unique um, because they're mostly for the most, a lot of public health, mm -hmm. actually yeah. a lot of public health students and pre-med and, you know, very analytical and smart students. So, you know, it's great. It's, I, I kind of look at that as well. Like um, part of doing this podcast, it's like, I'm stealing for you. I just hope y'all know it, that I can learn like, yeah, yeah. Say some, wow. say some gems right there. Tell me about some artists Very I need great. to check into. And like, you know, just it, it's, it's great. I think it's great to be in those conversations, um, whether it be from an educational standpoint or from a community standpoint where you're, you're able to learn and exchange. I, I think that right. that's huge and it keeps you interested and it keeps you sharp. Like, how do you sharp. stay like connected with like if, if someone's like, oh, I don't look at any current art. It's like, that's oh, a lane. Gosh. Sure. But yeah. I don't know if that is what one should be doing. <laughs> right. No, I just took a trip to New York to hit museums and going to Philly tomorrow to, you know, so. <laughs> you know, it's part of my job. I mean, it's part of what I would do anyway, but it's also part of my job. Like I need to, you know, I like to be informed. I like to know what's going on. And I bring that back to my students and to my own work. Yeah. Um, and in conversations, like it's exciting to see what's current in, you know, the art world. So yeah, yeah I, I see the two, you know, they work together, education and my own studio practice. And, and to me, that's a big piece of the culture, right? Where if if I go traveling, that a, a museum, maybe two, if I can get in three, oh, sure. that's always part of the trip because 
I think if you go to a place and you're not absorbing any of the culture, like I like to go to quote unquote the sketchy areas because, you know, I love hearing when white people talk about Baltimore being sketchy. It's like (laughs) enough. But I like to go to the sketchier areas. Right. Just because I think that's that's where the exciting stuff is at. Exactly. Exactly. You don't want to just go to the, you know, inner harbor or whatever. Go to the tourist tourist area is somewhere, you know. Yeah, you want to go where people live and go to the restaurants and see the neighborhood. And, uh, yeah, you're just you're describing exactly what I do. I mean, the last yeah. the last little trip I took was in Rhode Island, and they have this like nice chain of coffee shops in Providence. Um, and it happened to be when uh, school just restarted, so it's like people were coming in there dropping off their kids. In the span of that oh, week, okay. I went to each one of the coffee shops of that chain, and I was like, okay, I got a problem. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, diff- <laughs> a little different. Yeah. <laughs> it was good stuff. Um, it was one I was in the museum, and um, it was just like I was like, "This is great. This is the prime trip for me. I got all the stuff that I wanted to get, and right. that you know, being around the small businesses, going to the museums, and seeing like just just that that desire to learn because we were so close to the where we were situated. We were so close to just a college. You could just throw a rock and you hit a college student. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Baltimore has so much good art anyway. Like, you know, I love what the BMA is doing and went to the Walters last weekend. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's always something going on. Um, so I got three more questions before I get into these ridiculous rapid fire questions. So uh, what do you believe are three key elements of creating a good composition? Oh, boy. Um <laughs> Well, <laughs> color, shape, and form. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just whatever, yeah. whatever um, communicates whatever it is that you're trying to communicate. You know, I mean, if we're really talking formally, you know, like I can put my educator hat on and say, you know, like, you know, good composition would include this or that. Like, sure. I don't do really complicated compositions in my work. I do very, I, you know, what I call icon, iconic compositions, you know, like I grew up very Irish Catholic, you know, like in church every Sunday, um, you know, and that idea of the singular image surrounded by negative space, you know, of course, Andy Warhol does that too. Um, but, you know, this idea of isolating something so that you look at it, you know, closer. And I like doing that with like, dollar store trinkets and, you know, things that really aren't monetarily valuable, you know, to put them in this like serious setting Mm -hmm. of like, no, really look at this, you know, because that really affects more of what we believe than, you know, high priced items because, you know, mass produced items are mass produced. More people have them. Um, but, you know, we were just talking about looking at art. Um, I was really struck. I went to the Whitney and saw the Jennifer Packer show. And it uh, it was she's an artist, you know, a painter who um, I wasn't that familiar with her work. And I was just blown away by her compositions. Um, and, you know, it's this the way she you would do a room interior, for instance, with a figure is this kind of like you know, part of it's in focus, part of it's out of focus, but then there are these abstract qualities with the representational figurative work. And so I think, you know, a good composition really has abstract, you know, it works abstractly. If we're talking about painting, you know, it works abstractly first. Mm -hmm. And then if it's saying something or depicting something, okay, that's secondary to, you know, how this reads visually. Okay, I feel like I feel like I'm learning something. I might take a dip a toe back in to the whole. Uh, All right. <laughs> uh, uh, so let's see. Um, speak on artist comparisons. Is, is that like uh, artistic comparisons or artist comparisons? Is that something that mm-hmm. like you struggle with being compared to maybe other artists in any ways or in the past or now? And and how how would you move past that if you you were? Um. Not really. I mean, um, no, I haven't, you know, that has not been an issue. Um, I think when I was doing like a lot of the figurine paintings, um, a lot of people would compare my work to Liliana Porter 
um, who did mostly photography, but, you know, in a very similar vein of like this isolated sort of figurine in a, in a field, um, like a color field. And, um, actually it was kind of interesting because I went to a thrift store once in Jer Jersey city and I found this broken penguin <laughs> knickknack. Yeah. So it wasn't even one that was new. It was like old. Right. And I brought it home and I was like something about this, the way it's broken and everything was super cool. I want to do a painting of it. And I happened to buy a book about Liliana Porter. And when I opened it up, Oh my God, there was that penguin. <laughs> And I just was like, how is that possible? This is not even a new pay. I found it in a thrift store and she had made a photograph of it. So um, I happened to know someone who knew her. So I emailed her and just, we had some other, I had read her biography and we had some other things in common too. And so I just reached out and said, hi, you know, and uh, she was really nice and emailed me back and said, yes, there are many coincidences between our, our, our life. And I just thought that was great. You know? Um, yeah. So that's, I would say the only person, you know, once I was giving a talk and someone said, Oh, you know, it's like Kara Walker because you're, you know, this, this, um, you know, she's been, you know, people have criticized her work for showing representations that um, are challenging. Right. And so I was doing that with women and I just said, thank you. Oh my God. You know, thank you for saying my name in the same context as her. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I mean, you know, bring it. Sure. It's that's part of it is like, we learn from each other and um, yeah, I'm happy to be compared to someone else who I really like. That's great. Um, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I've gotten the comparison a few different times with other podcasts. It was like, oh, you're just like this. And I was like, ugh. And it's kind oh, of that, that's yeah. it's kind of that, that spot where, and, and this is um, also an advocate for trying to get over podcasters as a, or podcasting as a, as a form of art, not just something that's just disposable. Right. And just when someone makes that comparison, it's said almost in a pejorative way. Oh, you're just like this. It's like, ugh. oh, OK. And it's just like yeah. we talk about maybe similar things. There's only so many topics out there. But what what's one's slant on it? What's one's perspective on it? And how that's right. What's their approach on it? And that's the way that I try to differentiate myself. And right. um, trying to try to have well researched questions. And speaking of which, that's a segue into my rapid fire questions, because you uh -oh. actually answered both of my last two questions in that last part there. So bravo to you. Oh, uh, oh I'm curious. What were they? <laughs> no, you, you, you answered you answered the one and the other one. Just the, what I was looking for was already in it. So. Oh, OK. <laughs> so the rapid fire questions, I got three of them for you. Um, okay. Now. So I love your, your work with flowers. That's what I kept noticing when I was on your website. Do you have a favorite flower? Ooh, do I have a favorite flower? I don't actually. Um, no, I don't. I just love them all. I mean, it's something that, you know, I've been painting them, but I also am someone who buys myself flowers. I like have fresh flowers in my house all the time because it just brings me joy. Um, yeah. So I don't really have a favorite. It's whatever's out there when I go out, you know, I dig it. I, yeah. um, I went on this rant a couple of years ago with my girlfriend. It was like more so me being ridiculous. And I was like, men like flowers as well. <laughs> right. Right. And she was like, Bring me flowers. <laughs> she was like, do you have a favorite? I was like, I do not teach me. And it, it's like right. me being ridiculous, like a big man child about it. She was just like, you're, you're a cartoon character. I was like, I like flowers. <laughs> right. I still have the well, card. I do like summer when all the sunflowers are in, you know, and you can buy them anywhere. That's nice. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I, and I think you you may have touched on this, but I still will ask, and it's it might be partially um, for my own benefit. Um, music, podcast, or silence when you're in the studio? Which what's what's the sound? What's the sound? Mm, there? Silence. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. No. No. Okay. I've always been. Yeah. I mean, I, to a certain degree, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm painting, it's silence. Mm -hmm. If I'm you know, priming a canvas or doing, you know, work where I don't really have to focus that much, then I can, I like to listen to music. Oh, I was hoping podcast. I was about to just chime. Uh, no. <laughs> so this is the, the last one I have, and I think I have an answer for it already. Cause you know, my research, uh, hidden talent. Do you have a hidden talent? 
<laughs> All right. Uh, yes, I do. Or at least I used to. <laughs> I have two black belts in two different martial arts. Is that the one that you saw or? <laughs> oh, I think it was another one. I didn't know about that one. So what's oh. one of the martial arts? Wow. <laughs> oh, Margaret well, over kicking ass. Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> I'm a founding member of the Baltimore Aikido Club. Nice. Um, we founded it back in 1980 something. Um, and I have a black belt in Aikido and also in Naginata, um, which I got a, my black belt in Naginata. It's a martial art that only women do in Japan, which yeah. is super awesome. Oh, yeah. um, and on Naginata is like a long staff. Um, and that was 2009, I believe I got my black belt in that. So, oh, yeah. yeah, you're, you're the, what was, what was your, uh... I, I feel like I saw something about kombucha, but maybe I'm bugging. <gasps> I did try that. Okay. Yeah. A student of mine gave me a kombucha um, kit. Yeah. And so I did during the pandemic, I tried and then it didn't last very long, but it was good while it lasted a couple okay. of months tops. <laughs> so, so you're, so technically you're the second person that's been on this podcast who has a background in the martial arts. Um, oh. I, I interviewed um, a chef um, who he's like, Oh yeah. Like I, I I'm a karate practitioner. I was like, hold up. What? <laughs> So it was a really, it was a really cool conversation. He turned out to be a fellow Aquarius. I was like, uh, we're boys now. Oh, I'm an Aquarius too. Really? Yeah. Isn't that great? My, my birthday is next week. Uh, so yeah, let's get it. Oh, uh, wow. I'm a February yeah. Aquarius. So. Okay. We, we tolerate the February Aquarians, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, happy early birthday and all of that good stuff. Yeah, you um, too. yeah thank you. Um, so that's pretty much all the questions that I had, but I want to invite you to, as I like to say, shamelessly plug, where can find folks find you online, check out your work, um, in social media, if you got it. Sure. Um, so it's Margaret dash Murphy.com because of course there's a million Margaret Murphy's in the world. Um, and, but it'll actually come up on the first page of Google, um, which is amazing along with nuns and, um, there's an English crime writer named Margaret Murphy. Um, You're not her? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I do like crime novels, though. Um, and then, yeah, I'm on Instagram as Murphy Marg and Facebook on occasion. Um, and, yeah, I guess it's just Margaret Murphy. I don't even know. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I'm at Johns Hopkins at my studios in Area 405. And, yeah, that's it. So thank you so much. I'm going to do my closing. So um, for Margaret Murphy, I am Rob Lee saying that there's art in and around Baltimore. You just got to look for it. <laughs>